Well, good evening, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to tonight's Understanding Ag and Soil Health Academy webinar in regards to the six-legged stewards being presented tonight by Ralph Washington, Jr. Uh, we wanna make sure if you have any questions, please submit your questions throughout the presentation. And at the end of Ralph's presentation, we'll try to go through your questions. Um, Ralph Washington Jr. is a consultant entomologist <clears throat> and is vice president of Carol Lowell Biological Research. He has been an enthusiastic student of arthropods since his early childhood. His favorite thing about small creatures is that studying their lives often provides helpful lessons for his own. He believes that appreciating insects is critical to our efforts in improving the state of the environment. Um, I got the privilege to meet Ralph last summer at a field day, and what I was blown away with was his passion for entomology and his expertise in regards to the subject. So Ralph, welcome to our webinar tonight. Thank you very much, Jane. So we'll go ahead and let you proceed with your presentation. Do you have any comments you'd like to make prior to starting? Sure. I'd like to say I very much appreciate everyone for coming to listen to me perhaps wax poetic about insects. Insects bug people a lot, so I hope not to do that to you as you listen to me talk about them. Well, I'll let you proceed, sir. Thanks a lot, Shane. All right, everyone. So I think let's start by discussing what an insect is in some small part because arthropods are a huge group. They include millipedes, centipedes, spiders, scorpions, crustacea, and the insects. And for the purpose of this presentation, I'm gonna restrict discussion to the insects because we can talk about spiders and all kinds of other arthropods that help out in agriculture, but that's a much bigger thing, much bigger topic. And so if we keep it to just the insects, it'll make it a little easier, a little more focused. So an insect, you've all experienced insects. Insects are all around us. They're probably the most alien creatures with which we interact on a daily basis. And they are defined by a few specific characteristics. So insects have one pair of antennae, they have two compound eyes, and often three ocelli, which are simple eyes on the top of their head. They have three pairs of legs and two pairs of wings usually. There are of course some wingless insects that, were, that never gained wings. And then there are some insects that lost their wings later on. But for the most part, most insects have two pairs of wings. And then additionally, their body parts are constricted into three main regions that have a focus and function. Those are the head, thorax, and abdomen. The head is focused on sensory function. The thorax is primarily for locomotion and the abdomen is for reproduction and digestion. So that's basically what an insect is. You've seen them a lot for the purpose of this conversation, we're going to talk about insects specifically. Now the thing about insects is, insects represent, at least in the identified number of species, more than 80% of all known animal life. That's an incredible thing, that we're often more familiar with the four-legged, furry, and bright-eyed creatures that we keep in our houses, but those represent a very small fraction of the actual animal diversity in the world. And it they represent a very small fraction of the contribution to global ecology and the health of the environment. So I think if we're going to be responsible stewards ourselves, we need to work in partnership with the stewards that have been here for hundreds of millions of years. So they have an incredibly tremendous diversity and sometimes we're not able to recognize that because they're small. Now, if we were to instead picture them, image them based on their relative diversity, insects would dwarf mammals by many orders of magnitude. So here is what's called a species scape. In this image, each unit in the image is relative to a certain number of species. And so then you just apportion a certain number of units in the image based on the total number of identified species in that taxon and that general like classification. So the elephants of course represent the mammals, the turtles represent the reptiles, the salamander represents the amphibians, the birds represent the birds, and so on. But you look at the largest, the clearly dominating taxon in this image are the insects. 
So they have an influence on global ecology that far outstrips, is far out of proportion to their size and to how conspicuous they are to us. Now, the thing that I like to do, uh, I think the thing that is usually easiest for all of us is that when we want to learn about something new or we want to adopt a different perspective, we try and find some way in which it might be relative to something we actually care about, something we value or something we're already interested in. So let's start with talking about a very peculiar insect that is very important for something a lot of us like, which is chocolate. So these are the flowers of Theobroma cacao, the plant that provides us with chocolate. Chocolate is delicious. It's incredibly important to us uh, for economic purposes. It's also a really important crop in certain parts of the world and it's delicious. We all love it. Well, the thing is, many of the crops that we value are pollinated by honeybees or pollinated by flies and butterflies. And this one is not primarily pollinated by any of those. It's primarily pollinated by a little noceum. So the thing is, especially for those of you who have a ranch or you live in like pasture land or irrigated farmland, you've probably been out on your porch around like 5 p.m., maybe in the the southeast and you've been bitten by really annoying noceums. Sometimes people call them five O's. They're in the family Ceratopogonidae and they also have a tremendous diversity. The interesting thing about them is that although many of them bother us, others feed on the blood of different animals like other insects because they're so small. But the thing is many of the animals, many of the flies that are related to these Ceratopogonids also feed on plant juices or nectar. So although they might acquire blood to provide nutrients for their offspring and the developed brood, many of them need to visit flowers or visit extra floral nectaries. And so noceums in the genus Forsipomyia do exactly that and they visit flowers of Theobroma cacao. And so if it weren't for them trying to get the delicious nectar of those chocolate flowers, we wouldn't be able to enjoy a Reese's peanut butter cup or chocolate syrup over ice cream, or chocolate-covered strawberries. So, although they seem pretty annoying to us, they have an incredibly important function, something we already care about. Now, there are other insects, of course, that bother us and that are also ecologically important. And the ones that I think we loathe the most and we're also least likely or least eager to appreciate are mosquitoes. So if you had a pond or a bird fountain, bird bath in your backyard, and you saw a wrath of Culex eggs, because this is these are eggs of uh, mosquitoes in the genus Culex, and if you saw that wrath there, you might be really upset, because hey, those larvae are gonna hatch out of those eggs, they're going to develop in the pupae, and then they're eventually going to develop into adults. So this Culex mosquito is the primary bridge vector for West Nile virus, it's kin vector of St. Louis encephalitis as well. And so it's very annoying. Mosquitoes, at least in most people's consciousness, represent a strong source of irritation. And then depending upon where you are in the world, they might be a really important medical or veterinary concern. Although in the United States, we don't have to deal with a lot of immediate or persistent mosquito-borne illnesses, we did at one point in the past, and there are many people in the world who have to deal with them on a daily basis. So for us, for the most part, in many places in the US, um, mosquitoes are just an annoyance. We don't want them around, but they don't harm us in the same way that others are, that, that they would or do for people in different parts of the world. However, the thing is, although we loathe mosquitoes and they rightfully have a place in our recognition as a really dangerous pest, depending upon where we are, many of them are really important ecologically. So all mosquitoes live in pools of water, right? Usually stagnant water. Some of that water is something like, I don't know, as I said, a bird bath, or it could be an abandoned swimming pool. It could be a vase of flowers in your backyard, or it could be, depending upon the species, a hoof print in the side of the road or an upturned mushroom. They all feed on microbes in that water. And microbes around the world are extremely important in global nutrient cycling. And so if mosquitoes weren't regulating the diversity of the microbes in all of these collected bodies of water in the world, 
we might not have the global nutrient cycling that's so important for global health and diversity. Now, the thing is, that's a more like overarching meta issue associated with mosquitoes, but there are many mosquito species that have more direct, immediate way, reasons to appreciate them. So from the standpoint of biological control, we can talk about mosquitoes in the genus Toxorhynchites. So these are elephant mosquitoes. And as you can tell, these mosquitoes look a little bit bigger and different than the larvae of Culex or other mosquito genera. And one reason why their thoraces are so big is because they have a lot of muscles in there that connect in and help them grow and help them feed. So they are predators. They feed on the mosquito larvae of mosquitoes of other species. And when they become adults, they have incredible coloration and very curved mouth parts, and they don't feed on blood at all. Like other mosquitoes, they feed on nectar or extrafloral nectaries, plant juices, but they don't bother humans. They don't bother any other mammals. They never suck blood. They have acquired sufficient nutrition as larvae so that they can produce their brood without feeding. And so they have an important function in many ecosystems to regulate mosquito, other mosquito species. And they can also be used potentially as a biological control agent, depending upon the context. Now they live in often phytotelmata. So these are pools of water and plants. That's what the word means. So like a, a tree hole and an oak tree, or if any of you have ever been to a tropical environment like in Florida, you might see heliconia, you might see bromeliads. There are many examples of phytotelmata and these mosquitoes, Toxorhynchites, are one of the genera that you can find there a lot. Another genus that you can find there is the genus Sabethes. This is a gorgeous mosquito and it is somewhat unique in its coloration and behavior. And I often try and introduce this to people as an example of the fact that not all species meet our expectations. So we often think of mosquitoes as annoying. We also often think of them as ugly. They're brown and drab, many of them, even if they have like nice white lines along a black scaled carapace, still it doesn't strike us as well, strike us aesthetically the same way this one does. So the thing about this mosquito, uh, it is a, it, it exhibits aerial courtship. And the, if you look at its legs, it has fans of hairs along its legs that it'll wave around. You can see them more clearly here and you can see it there. So the males will fly in front of a female and wave their forelegs, kind of like an air traffic controller, like with, you know, the wands. It, it'll wave their foreleg, their, not their foreleg, sorry, their, their mid legs with the, the tibial fans in an elaborate pattern. And then the female will respond once the male lands and some more stereotype or choreographed behavior occurs. And that's what precedes mating. This is a really in interesting behavior to exhibit. They live in tall trees, like they feed on monkeys that climb high in the trees. They also lay their eggs in really interesting ways. So there's a related species called Sabethes chloropterus that lays its eggs inside bamboo internodes. And so you might imagine if you're walking through the forest, walking through a jungle in South America, and you find a stand of bamboo, like a stalk of bamboo that's maybe on the ground, you shake it, there's some water inside, you don't really see a way for any water to get in or out. Well, if you were to cut it open and look inside, sometimes you might find little mosquito larvae living inside. And it's curious. How does it get in there? Well, on many of these bamboo, pieces of bamboo, there might be little beetles that got into the bamboo ahead of time and made a little hole and left it as they exited. So what Sabethes chloropterus will do is it will hover in front of the bamboo and shoot an egg through the hole. And it can do this with incredible accuracy. From maybe 10 centimeters away, it can fire an egg through a one millimeter hole with a dead shot which is incredible. The fact that these mosquitoes, which are so important medically and so annoying to us in many contexts, the ones we experience might not represent the diversity, might be misrepresenting the amazing traits that they have. So another example of that is mosquitoes in the genus Malaya. So most of the time when we see mosquitoes trying to get food, what they do is they fly up to us, they fly in our face, they fly on our back, they're flying in our ears, we're really annoyed about the sound, and then they'll, they'll orient to smells, they'll land on us and they'll bite. We really don't like it. Well, 
because mosquitoes are so good at developing behaviors that allow them to find their hosts and manipulate hosts, some mosquitoes in the genus Malaya have developed a relationship with certain ants in the genus Chromatogaster. So what happens is these mosquitoes, they live around these ants and when they need food, they will land in front of an ant and they'll take their forelegs and they'll tap the ant on the head in a stereotyped way, kind of the way that ants tap each other on the head. If any of you have ever looked at ants in the column as they meet each other, like a foraging column, they're walking along, they go up to each other and they'll tap each other on the head with their antennae and they'll exchange a little bit of food. So like, you know, if say Ray and I were walking up along a path in the morning and we both just had some breakfast, we'd say hello. Hey, what's going on, Ray? They're like, hey, what's going on, Ralph? Hey, how are you doing today? And the way Ray might communicate that is, I'm doing well, would you like some of my breakfast? And I would say, yes, would you like some of mine? Well, this Malaya mosquito takes advantage of the fact that ants do that all the time. The ants are exhibiting what's called trophallaxis, the reciprocal exchange of food. And the mosquito taps the ant on its head, the ant opens its mouth, the mosquito inserts its proboscis into the mouth, ant's mouth, into its crop, consumes some food, and flies away. And that's its exclusive source of adult nutrition. So, again, if we were to think that we knew everything there is to know about mosquitoes based on our experience with the annoying ones or the ones that are medically dangerous, we might be unwilling or unable to appreciate the tremendous diversity exhibit around the world. So there's another group of flies that exhibits really interesting diversity and is ecologically important. These ones don't bite us, but they can be quite annoying depending upon where you are. So there is a group of flies in the family Ephydridae. These are the shore flies. And so if any of you have been around a big lake, like for example, Mono Lake in California or the Great Salt Lake in Utah, and you've been beleaguered by flies coming out of decaying vegetation along the bank and then landing on your face or flying around your head, you might have really disliked them. Well, the thing is they're ecologically important in many of these extreme environments. So in Mono Lake, in California, it's a very alkaline environment, it's very soapy, and these flies live in it. The larvae develop in it, they feed on algae deep beneath, and they rest up, they come to the surface. Birds feed on the adults, they feed on the larvae and the pupae, and many indigenous groups in California have harvested their pupae over the years because insects have been a tremendous source of nutrition for different cultures around the world for thousands of years. And we kind of just have a, a bias, at least in the United States and other parts of the Western world, where we're unlikely to eat them despite their great nutritional value and often their delicious taste. So ephedras are really interesting. Now there's one ephedra that I think is particularly worthy of note that I think everyone should know about. And that's Hyliomyia petrali. So I'm sure that you all know about the La Brea tar pits, how saber-toothed cats have been harvested there, all kinds of mammoths, various fossils of prehistoric megafauna. But crude petroleum is a toxic environment. It's very challenging to persist there. Very few things live in or on it. And if you, any of you or I were to drink some of it, it would be a huge problem for us. It's really important to us in terms of fossil fuels and plastics, medical technology, so many things that have happened in the world are an explicit consequence of our manipulation of petroleum, but it's very toxic. It needs to be managed in a very careful way. Well, there is a little fly, Hyliomyia petrali, which as larvae live in and along the surface membrane of the petroleum, and they capture insects that fall onto the surface and consume them. And in the process, they must sequester crude petroleum in considerable amounts that they then excrete when they molt into an adult. And that's an incredible thing to do, to develop the physiology and the detoxification process that allows you to mitigate the consequences of consuming such a toxin and then sequester it in your own tissue until you can release it later. So this is what the adult looks like. It's pretty incredible. Now, the thing is, Many insects, or I should say that Hyliomyia petrali and ephedrids are not the only example of insects finding nutrition in peculiar ways. So we all love butterflies, right? Butterflies are beautiful. 
they are often ambassadors to the insect world for people who might loathe all the other diversity of insects. And we think of them as examples of flying sunshine because we associate them with bright experiences. We associate them with flowers. They're clean, we can see their wing breeds. They're not slimy like other creatures and they have all these positive associations in our mind. But butterflies have complicated lives just like any other creature in the world. Now, what these butterflies are doing is they are feeding on salt exudes from this, from this crocodile. And so you, it, they feed on tears, they feed on, on excretions in the nose, they feed on all kinds of things that are salty. Because when you're feeding on nectar, nectar doesn't have a lot of salt. And so female butterflies are in a situation of salt scarcity. So in order for their larvae, in order for their offspring to be viable, they need a sufficient amount of salt. So what male butterflies do is they'll feed on all kinds of creatures, feed on their tears. They'll also feed on carrion and they also feed on dung. So they have this very complicated relationship with the local ecology and that they're consuming so much of this salt in order to provide it then in a nuptial gift to their mates so that their offspring will achieve the right kind of viability and develop at the rates that they would expect. So the thing is, we think of dung primarily as a fertilizer for plants. We know that dung beetles need it. We know that certain other soil dwelling arthropods need it, but butterflies often make great use of dung. So I think this is a, a nice little example of the fact that when we are improving the diversity of our habitat and we're making sure that it functions, according to certain ecological principles, when we're trying to integrate those principles of regenerative agriculture in there. For example, the most important thing, making sure that there are large mammals that can naturally fertilize the ground. It isn't just the dung beetles that are gonna benefit. It might be incredibly beautiful butterflies. And so when we want to take a break and take a picnic in a nice alpine meadow, the butterflies around might be there because they were able to feed on some manure that some grazing cattle left behind as they were walking across the landscape. So the thing is, butterflies aren't the only example of Lepidoptera that have alternative ways of finding food. So this is a moth called Calyptra thalic tree. You can find it in Southeast Asia. And it might be quite uh, scary to some people because this moth feeds on blood. So we think of mosquitoes as vampires. We think of noceums as vampires. We think of horse flies, we think of stable flies, a few other flies. But this moth uses its mouth parts, the males in particular, uses its mouth parts to winnow in through the skin in order to suck blood, which is quite salty compared to nectar. They'll also feed on lacrimal secretions, lacrimal secretions, the, the, um, the tears or any other exudes from the eye, that's what it's called. So they're doing it for the same reason that the butterflies feed on the manure or the carrion because they need that salt. Now, they want the salt to get their offspring viable, and this is one way to do it. Another way to acquire enough proteins that you can develop successfully is to just ignore the whole process of feeding on nectar and get your offspring to feed on something else instead. Because, hey, caterpillars feed on vegetation. We know that, whether they're eating your leaves, eating your crops, whatever it is, they get really annoying, we don't like them. But there are some in certain in certain environments that are really important and have a very peculiar way of getting their food. So I'm going to show you a video of a very interesting insect I'm quite fond of. Let's face it, most caterpillars already look pretty strange, but their behavior isn't. Larvae of both moths and butterflies most caterpillars spend their short lives inching from leaf to leaf, munching on vegetation. But this caterpillar isn't a vegetarian. It's a professional killer. On the island of Hawaii, 18 of the 20 native species of caterpillar have evolved into carnivorous predators. Perfectly camouflaged and armed with sharp, pincer-like claws, 
the larva cuts a channel into the leaf and waits. Other species mimic twigs or leaves, and these unsuspecting fruit flies never had a chance. No one knows why Hawaii's caterpillars turned into insect eaters. But one thing's for certain. In the evolutionary soup of isolated islands, it's easy to dish up something bizarre. So, this is the species Eupithecia oracloris. And, as the video showed, there are many species in the genus Eupithecia that exhibit this behavior of ambush predation. Hawaii has a really interesting ecology because it's an island chain and in many archipelagos, there is a lot of you know, peculiar diversity that happens. In some places we see island gigantism or animals who grow really big. In other places we see animals get really small. But in most places that are isolated, you see animals exhibit peculiar behaviors because one founder will get there and it will diversify in a really interesting way. So we have inchworms, we have predatory caterpillars, and they're completely counter to our expectations about what inchworms would do. I mean, I've definitely spent time as a kid looking up at a tree and seeing a little inchworm move along, seeing it drop down on a thread, or seeing it chew on a leaf. But outside of the context of Hawaii, it's unlikely I'd see an inchworm or another caterpillar feed on food like this, capture prey and eat it, consume it. I think it's really interesting because caterpillars and other Lepidoptera exhibit so many different behaviors that are important for helping us understand what's going on in our local ecology. So the adult is a geometrid. That's what inchworms look like as adults. And I'm sure you've all heard of the peppered moth in England, Biston betularia which was such an important example of how human caused changes in the environment can influence the appearance and the traits of a local species. So the term industrial melanism was developed to refer to this habit or this phenomenon that happened to the species Biston betularia when in England, the industrial revolution occurred and then a bunch of soot from the countryside blanketed trees so prior to that soot, there was a white form of this moth. There, it, it came in two different morphs, basically. One that was light colored, one that was black colored. And the light colored moth morph um, was camouflaged against the lichen on the trees. So the black colored morph was seen more easily and would be eaten more frequently. Well, when the soot started covering the trees and killing the lichen, the black covered morph was mu had much easier camouflage and the white colored morph was much easier seen. And so that would be fed on more. And so we observed over a very short amount of time, a change in the relative proportion of which morph you see in the population. And so this is an example, just like many other insects, of the fact that insects can be indicators of what's happening in the environment. So one way that insects can be important indicators of environmental health or the circumstances that are occurring is in water columns. So we are aware of mayflies, we know about caddisflies, sometimes we also know about stoneflies, and the EPT test is one thing that a lot of aquatic biologists use, where they will go into a stream or water body and they will sample with a dip net, it's like a D-shaped net, they'll ruffle up the bottom and they'll collect all the insects that they're able to find that are resting in the water and on the surface on the bottom of, of like a creek or something like that. They'll identify them to sometimes to species, but often to genus and family. And then they'll determine what the relative proportion is of the families that they might've been looking for. Because some families within those orders, the order Ephemeroptera, which are the mayflies, the order Plecoptera, the stoneflies, and the order Trichoptera, the caddisflies. Some species within those three orders are very sensitive to environmental pollutants and others are more resistant. And so depending upon the relative proportion you have in the sample you collected, 
it might indicate that although the water seems clear and beautiful and nice to drink, there might be some invisible pollutants that are coming from an upstream location that you need to need to recognize. And this can be particularly important for the context of regenerative agriculture. So we all know that if they have poor infiltration in your soil, then the water is going to sit on the top and all of your inputs are going to soak in that water and it's going to wash off. So we have a huge problem with effluent going into streams and not enough water going back in the water table. Well, that's not just going to affect your crops. That's also going to affect the local ecology because if you have too much of your inputs coming off of your soil and going into the local water, that's going to that's going to influence the balance of nutrients in the water column there, which is going to influence the microbes, the algae, and all the local invertebrates that are present in the water body. And when they're affected, that might affect the different plants that are present there and the larger animals that feed on them, the fish, and by extension, the fish to the birds and, and, and the, the larger mammals that are eating the birds. All of this is, is intimately connected. And so by paying attention to the insects that are present, and when area near a site that we're, we're making changes or we're trying to improve things, it can give us a better handle on how good we are, how effective we've become in making the changes that we desire. So when we want to conserve environments, we need to remember that there's often an intimate relationship between different animals. This is an image of a butterfly called Maculinia arion, the large blue, which in England became extinct as a consequence of habitat loss. And they tried a number of things to try and bring it back. So it lives in rolling hillsides, like kind of pasture land where there's thyme and oregano. And after it, was, after it went extinct, they tried to bring in populations from neighboring countries and reintroduce it, but they had a lot of trouble until they realized that in some lands where it's more successful, these butterflies have an intimate relationship with certain ants. So the butterflies are in a family called Lycenidae and the Lycenids, the blues, often have this life cycle where the larvae, the caterpillars, they'll feed on a certain plant like oregano or thyme for a few instars and then they'll drop off at a certain point and expose an organ on the top of their body that has a sweet secretion and a nice smell. This will attract ants, which will then bring the larvae into their nests and the larvae will further develop. And the larvae will do two things. So the larvae will accept food from the ants and then sometimes it'll feed on the brood of the ants. So you have this intimate relationship between the butterflies and the ants in these grazing areas and cattle come in here because they keep the plants in check because you don't want the plants to get out of control. You want a certain amount of plants. And the plants also are releasing a compound. The, the, the butterflies find the plants by honing in on chemicals that are released by the plants to ostensibly deter the ants. So when the butterflies come in, they recognize the repellent chemical that the plant is, is releasing. Then they will feed on the plant They'll develop further, they'll drop off, they'll get collected by the ants and brought into their nest, and then they'll eat some of the ants or inhibit the growth of the ant colonies. So you have this environment where you have this interaction where the plants are taking advantage of what, oh, sorry, the, the plant, yeah, the plants are taking advantage of the relationship between the butterflies and the ants, and the butterflies are taking advantage of the chemicals that the plants are releasing, which signal that the ants are nearby. And all of this is necessary. In order for this to happen, you need to have the right kind of grass growing, the right kind of crops, and this is more successful when you're having, like, say, a rotated pasture land. When instead of it being grazed down completely all the time, you have things, you have animals moving through, and you're tending them. Now, the interesting thing I think about insects in general, other than everything I mentioned so far, that they have these complex interactions with each other. They contribute to the environment in different ways. They have interesting behaviors and traits. The thing is, we can learn from them so that we can better manage them. We have these interests, we have these, these strong and developed relationships with insects that have been really long lasting and they're really important. 
And one of the most important is apiculture. So human beings have been tending bees for such a long time. And one of the more developed ways that we've been tending them recently, and by recently in human history, I mean the past you know, few hundred thousand years, is use of European honeybees and their, their distribution across the globe. So European honeybees work very well, depending upon where you are in the world. In some places, they don't work as well, in part because of the predators that raid their colonies. So in Asia, the oriental hornet, Vesper, the Japanese hornet, sorry, Vesper manorinia, is a tremendous problem for European honeybees because what happens is the scout wasps will approach the honeybee hives, they'll evaluate them, they'll come back to their nest and then communicate the presence of the hive and also its relative size. Then a number of wasps will come in and they'll attack the hive, they'll kill the guard bees on the outside, they'll invade, they'll rip it apart, they'll steal a lot of brood and they're a huge problem for keepers of European honeybees. That's because the wasps are relatively impervious to honeybee stings and European honeybees don't have really any other adapted mechanisms to deal with them. However, Japanese honeybees do because they have evolved in concert with these wasps for a long time. They develop an interesting method to deal with them. So what they do is, again, the scout wasp will come in, say they're evaluating a honeybee hive, and they're approaching this, this instead, this, um, this Japanese honeybee hive. The scout wasp, before it leaves, the guard honeybees will jump onto it and release a signal to bees uh, to summon other bees from inside the hive. So all the bees will jump on it, and the bees will do something that they usually do when they need to warm up in the morning. So bees are capable of uncoupling their wings from the wing muscles in their thorax so that they can generate a lot of heat quite quickly. This is kind of like idling your car. When you have it parked in park gear, you have it in neutral, you're revving the engine, whatever you're doing in order to build up a lot of heat and like rev it without moving forward, they'll do that. So they'll uncouple their wings and they'll generate a lot of heat. So the bees will get in a cluster around the Japanese wasp, the Japanese hornet. They'll uncouple their wings and they'll start heating it up. And because they're inside, the carbon dioxide concentration inside of the ball increases. And as it increases, the thermal tolerance, the maximum thermal tolerance for the wasp changes. And so it, so it does for the honeybee. So they heat the ball to the point that the temperature inside the ball is one degree above the maximum thermal tolerance of the wasp and one degree below the maximum thermal tolerance of the honeybees. So invariably, a few bees die in the process. And even if quite a bit in this ball did, it would be worth it compared to the damage that the wasps would do to the hive if the guard escaped and summoned its sisters. So it's really interesting that we can observe, hey, these honeybees can show us that perhaps we need to use a different species or we need to approach the presence of these wasps differently if we're only paying attention to them. I think that's often the case that because of our perspective as you know, the most prominent thinking creatures on the planet, we think that we're able to solve a lot of problems without getting inspiration or getting assistance or advice from the creatures that we're interacting with. And so again, in order for us to proceed effectively through regenerative agriculture and through being responsible stewards of the world, we need to pay attention to the insects. This is the wasp. This is the oriental hornet. And it has a very interesting method of generating energy. So some researchers saw it much more active in really hot times. So insects are small, they have a high surface area to volume ratio. And so as a consequence, they're very prone to dehydration. Like if any of us are walking around in the desert, we feel really hot. Well, it's a lot, it's a much bigger deal for a small creature that's going to evaporate quickly if it doesn't keep everything tightened and keep a lot of water inside. It doesn't maintain a watertight cuticle. Well, the yellow band on its abdomen allows it to generate electricity when it's present in uh, an area with a lot of sun. The way it works is sunlight hits the yellow, the yellow pigmented area. There's a pigment called xanthopterin, and there are these melanin channels through which the solar energy is channeled, and it generates ATP, basic chemical energy that most organisms use. And so this wasp 
in really hot situations is able to acquire supplemental energy in conditions that would kill most other creatures. So it's really amazing to me that insects are able to survive and to circumvent certain ecological challenges in ways that we would never ex expect. You know, we have spent so much time and effort developing photovoltaics so that we can take advantage of solar energy in ways that are efficient and cost effective. But we have this wasp whose effect we've been doing it on its own for many millions of years. All right, so solar energy, hot environments can be really challenging for most creatures and some organisms are able to take advantage of it like that oriental hornet. Well, forest fires are a circumstance that we almost universally recognize as really damaging to a lot of living organisms. We know that there are many plants that germinate only after a fire and we know that fire leads to a lot of animals leaving an area and there's some predators that might be able to take advantage of that but it's hard to think of or hard to be aware of different contexts in which or specific contexts in which certain animals are dependent upon the fire to develop other than the germinating plants certain animals are dependent upon the fire for their general development and and actively cultivate opportunities well there's a buprested beetle so buprested are the metallic wood boring beetles this particular species this is melanophila cuminata it is not metallic in the same way that its brethren are throughout the, the family. However, it has a really interesting way of sensing forest fires. So these little pits in the side of its body, these thoracic pits, have a fluid filled sac that expands in response to infrared energy. And as it expands, it triggers a sensillum, a little like hair, and that causes a nerve impulse. This is quite similar to how many animals hear where distortion of a body, a fluid, a little like fluid sac, causes movement of a hair which triggers a nerve impulse. So you could say that it can hear fire. The interesting thing about these beetles is that their sensitivity to the infrared radiation from a fire is incredibly heightened. They can detect a forest fire from 60 kilometers away, which is quite impressive for a creature like this with relatively simple neurology. And they can also detect levels of infrared radiation from a fire that are relatively indetectable by our most sensitive instruments. So they can know when a forest fire has happened or is happening way before we can because of the fact that they have such a heightened and sensitive apparatus, which I find quite amazing. I mean, they're heavily dependent upon freshly burned wood for their larvae to develop. So it makes sense that they would have adapted so successfully to recognizing the signals of the circumstances they need for their offspring to develop. I'm just so impressed though, that they're able to recognize it this way and to hear fire. It really reminds me that organisms see and experience the world in radically different ways than we do. And I think it's also helpful to remember that we as people, we all experience the world in different ways that although one circumstance might not seem real to me, it might be completely real to another person. And that might not just be because I lack the experience, it might be because I actually can't perceive it. I haven't learned how to do that. Just in the same way that if we think that a fire isn't happening, this beetle does know it and it needs to know it. So it's wonderful, I think, sometimes when you can acquire or you can experience opportunities to experience empathy for other human beings as a direct consequence of learning about the lives of insects. So this is another beetle that ha relies on very specific environmental circumstances to develop. This is a beetle in the genus Pleocoma. And so these are called rain beetles. So rain beetles come out in a very specific set of environmental circumstances. So they require a few specific deluges of rain, and then they can emerge from the ground and mate and, and come in, uh, sorry, mate and, and lay eggs, and the offspring can then get back into the ground. The thing that's really amazing about Pleocoma is some of them are so, require such specific rains that they might only emerge once a year. And many of us maybe like rain, some people don't. For some, uh, a downpour might be really unpleasant, might be really annoying. But for this little beetle, you might be walking through the forest and you might be annoyed about a drizzle that happens in your day, but it might be the most important day in the lives of these little beetles. 
So dung beetles are potentially another source of inspiration for us. So I think all of us can admire dung beetles because of their persistence and the fact that they often have to work with something that's pretty unpleasant. I think we can all relate to the fact that many times throughout our lives, we might wake up, we have a lot on our plate and we feel really tired, we feel annoyed, we feel frustrated. And so we walk around all day feeling like, you know, we're pushing around a big ball of irritation. Well, these dung beetles are pushing around this ball of manure and they have to bury it. And in order to, they do that in order to, you know, feed their offspring. So that's their life, collecting dung and putting it in the ground over and over again. The cool thing though, is that these dung beetles, especially in certain places where it's dark, the nocturnal dung beetles, need some way of moving that dung. And they don't have lights in their head, they don't have flashlights. You gotta imagine, hmm, how are they doing this? Well, some researchers were able to determine that many dung beetles use the Milky Way to navigate. Some researchers in, used the planetarium in Johannesburg, South Africa to project an image of the Milky Way above uh, an arena. They had some little beetles that had hats, so those beetles were able to see above, and some beetles didn't have hats, and, or sorry, some beetles had hats, so they weren't able to see above, and some beetles didn't have hats, and so they were able to see just normal. The beetles that did have hats were unable to navigate back to the hole that they dug to bury their dung ball from where they collected the dung. And so they were able to recognize that the beetles are using the polarized light from these stars in order to make their way along the ground at night, which I think is a good reminder that regardless of how hard things get in life, you still need to take time to look up at the stars. I also think that dung beetles have peculiar behaviors that we might be surprised to learn about. So dung is, depending upon the dung, like herbivore dung is very nutritious. It has a lot of leftover protein and nutrients, a lot of leftover energy, but it's still not as efficient as feeding on animals. So just like Eupithecia or Chloris, there are some that the caterpillar, the ambush predatory caterpillar. There are dung beetles that have shifted over from feeding on dung, scavenging on dung, and they've become predators. So this is the species Canthon virens. And so instead of feeding on dung, it feeds on leaf cutter ant queens. So after a nuptial flight, all ants, when they release their reproductives, the ants will fly out, they'll mate in the land. And many of them have what are called deciduous wings. They'll shed their wings before they bury, before they start a colony. After the nuptial flight and after the queens have landed and shed their wings, these beetles will land on their thorax and decapitate them. And then they'll roll them up into a ball and bury them in the ground. Which is amazing to me because it's very uncommon for a species to shift from scavenging on dung all the way to predation. We have seen a lot of examples of organisms shifting from scavenging on dung to a different substance from scavenging to becoming an herbivore. We've also seen herbivores becoming a predator or becoming a facultative predator, meaning that they feed on, they, they predate sometimes, but not always. We've also seen predators shift to become herbivores or become pollen feeders, but it's very rare for an animal to shift from scavenging all the way to predation. And these beetles have done it. And they are not the only member of their group of their little subfamily of beetles that do that. There's another, that feeds on millipedes. So dung beetles have interesting traits, interesting anatomical traits that aid them in their, their ability to move dung. So they have uh, round butts on the right, it's a, uh, the dung beetle. This is a, a species that feeds on dung. They have little scoops on their head that can do it. Well, the A, beetle A and beetle C, these are pictures of the same beetle. Right, A and C are together, B and D are together. The A and C are, represent a species that feeds on millipedes. And so it has a scoop on the front of its head that it uses to get between the armored plates of a millipede and section it and cut it apart. And then after it's done so, it can drag it back to a burrow. It can roll it up into a bar and push it into the ground. Millipedes are not common food 
not common prey for a lot of insects because they have cyanide that they release or they have hydroquinones that they use to protect themselves. So many millipedes are chemically protected and as a consequence, they don't have the same number of prey that many other insects do, that non-toxic insects do, I should say. And so it's really interesting to see not just dung beetles feed on, or sorry, not just, not just insects feed on them, but dung beetles feeding on them and shifting over from scavenging in the process of doing that. And the fact that all these dung beetles in this subfamily, there are many species that have shifted from scavenging the predation, I find quite, quite compelling. I think it's an example of the fact that because insects are so numerous, there are so many different species, that it's more likely that we're going to observe them come up with radical ways to deal with challenging sources of nutrition, such as the coffee berry borer. So if any of you have ever dealt with coffee plantations, if you know anything about coffee, if you're involved in the growing of coffee, you know that it can be challenging if you have a lot of pests. Coffee berry borers can be a big deal. It's really tiny beetles that feed on the coffee berries they bore into it and they can really ruin your crops, depending upon where you are. Well, the thing is, coffee berry borers consume uh, a tremendous amount of caffeine. Some of them will consume the equivalent of 500 cups of coffee in one day, the proportional equivalent, which is incredible because if there is a maximum threshold past which we will die, human beings will die from, from consuming caffeine, and it is far below 500 cups. So the fact that these beetles have acquired some physiological means of consuming a deadly quantity, a proportionally deadly quantity of caffeine is really incredible. It's also a potential source of inspiration for physiological research about how to detoxify and deal with potentially hazardous compounds. Another example is the drugstore beetle. So the drugstore beetle is a problem because it will often feed on dried foodstuffs. It's not just feeding on drugs. It'll feed on tobacco and all kinds of other things in a drugstore. But there are many stored product pests that are a huge problem. And they're a problem because they've come up with some means by which they can deal with the toxic compounds that we sequester away. I think it's really interesting that it can feed on tobacco and can deal with nicotine, considering the fact that nicotine is a botanical insecticide. Right? We use neonicotinoids so effectively against insects because of the fact that they function against the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. They also affect us as a drug, as, a, um, they, as an intoxicant. However, they were adapted as a botanical insecticide and they're particularly effective in that regard. However, some insects are able to circumvent that. I find that interesting. So this is an insect that some of you might be familiar with, more so due to a product that it produces or that we produce from it. So cochineal or carmine dye is this red dye that we often use in, in food or have for a long time. And it comes from Dactylopius caucus, the cochineal scale. Now the thing is most compounds that an insect produce have a function, they have some purpose. It can be erroneous to assume that there's some adaptive function when we don't have evidence to, to demonstrate that. But in the case of this, we do know that it does have an adaptive function. And that adaptive function is, it's a deterrent to predators. So this cochineal dye that we consider really nice as a source of natural dye is a deterrent to the predators, like this caterpillar. So uh, the, the cochineal scale is protected against a lot of predators from the, the carmine dye. This caterpillar will actually feed on the scales in order to sequester that cochineal itself in order to protect it from predators. So we have the complex relationship on the prickly pear, or on the opuntia, where the dactylopius coccus will feed, it'll sequester this cochineal, that protects it from other predators. Well, the caterpillar is able to take advantage of that so that it is protected. And so again, insects are involved in these complex interrelationships. It's really intimate contact with other species involving different really interesting ways of circumventing challenges. And it's another clear reminder that the ecology that we're experiencing is a lot more complicated than we often recognize. For example, Many of you might be familiar with the desert locust, just a circa. So plagues like this, outbreaks happen periodically, especially in Africa and the Middle East, and it can be a huge economic problem. So a locust, for the sake of conversation, I'll, I'll mention is the migratory form of certain grasshoppers. So what will happen is the grasshoppers will be eating as young as nymphs, 
And when they are experiencing a certain, actually, sorry, the adults, the adults, uh, the, the grasshoppers will develop in circumstances where they're crowded. And when they're crowded, they recognize that there's not enough food around. They can predict that there'll likely not be enough food. There's a physiological signal and there's a process that happens in one generation that leads to them laying eggs that develop into nymphs and, and eventual adults that have longer legs and longer wings. So what happens is the first generation, the parents will experience scarcity of food and there won't be a lot of places to be, it'll be too much crowding. They're bumping up. I mean, there are certain, phys there are certain physical signals that they're keying in on, but it's not worth discussing in too much detail. But the grasshoppers will encounter each other in too hard a number and there might not be as enough food. So they will, their offspring will have longer legs, longer wings and acquire m greater fat stores. And that's when they will disperse. So these locust hordes can sometimes be anticipated. And we know from antiquity, from references in the Bible, from references in all kinds of literature and human history and oral traditions all over the place that locust hordes are center in our imagination as a, a sign of doom, a sign of horrible things happening. And there's a really immediate you know, consequence to a locust horde descending, right? It eats all your crops. If you don't have any food, what are you supposed to do, right? Your children might die, your livelihood might be ruined, it's horrible. And it's a good thing that we've come up with means to anticipate, warn people, and culturally deal with it. We can eat the locusts. We can try and uh, manage them, try and prevent their population from getting so big. But going back to what we were discussing about mosquitoes and earlier, that many organisms can have some ecological function that we don't appreciate or recognize because we're constantly thinking about how they impact our lives. The thing about locusts and their distribution across the environment is important to realize is that their distribution, when they're moving from one place to another, they're also transferring nutrients, nutrients between environments. So because they have a tremendous amount of nitrogen in their body and they have sequestered a lot of nutrients in their growth, when they move between environments, they are also distributing that nutrients, those nutrients to different places. This is the, a similar phenomenon that happens when periodical cicadas emerge in Eastern United States that we have this simultaneous emergence of a huge brood. <clears throat> Most animals will consume the cicadas, even deer and ostensible herbivores, because it's a, such an important source of nutrition that you have to get in on it. And the locusts, although they're definitely extremely damaging and impoverishing to so many human beings when they come in, they have an ecological function in distributing the nutrition and the biomass from one area to another. And so when we deal with them, we need to recognize the consequences of our interventions. But I would not in any way suggest that we don't try and manage circumstances to prevent human ills and prevent people from starving. Just when we're doing this, I think it's really complicated that we have this complex ecology. And when we're trying to manage the global environment, we need to be thoughtful about it in ways so that we recognize all of the different inputs and outputs. Now, I would like to transition to a group of insects I'm particularly fond of perhaps even more so than mosquitoes. And I think they disproportionately contribute to, or I'll say this, they contribute to the health of environments in ways that are disproportionate to how much we loathe them. So most people dislike cockroaches very much for various reasons. We just like the smell that some of them have. We don't like how they look. We don't like their association with filth. Well, the thing is, most cockroaches are pretty clean animals. They'll clean themselves. There are very few examples of cockroaches actually vectoring or distributing any diseases or bacteria, except for if they're on filth directly and then they're on your food. And many of them have appealing traits. They exhibit biparental care, so they have families. They take care of their young. They lick them to prevent fungal infection. And they're really physiologically resilient because they can store a lot of nutrients and they can deal with circumstances of starvation. They're also, many of them are really pretty. So this is a cockroach, it's diurnal in South America in the genus Pseudophilodromia, and it's a wasp mimic, very long wasp-like antennae, and its tapered body allows it to obtain some protection from potential predators because of the fact that it's out in the day, unlike other cockroaches that might be in the soil. This is the cockroach that's a pollinator of a tropical orchid. This is a cockroach that's an important distributor of seeds in the azalea, of a plant in the azalea family. And so because it is traveling around on the forest floor, 
the plant will release a seed pod around the time that the cockroaches have emerged. The cockroaches will feed on the seed pod and then as they move, they'll release the seeds in their feces and the seeds will be intact and they distribute them across the floor. The thing about this that's really interesting is we usually don't try and explore the contributions that cockroaches are making to the ecology and environments like this because of the fact that we're inclined to think of them as abhorrent and annoying creatures. So it's quite possible that considering the fact that cockroaches are in high abundance in the leaf litter in tropical environments, and there are a lot of plants that grow down there, that these cockroaches are really important for the distribution of seeds, much more so than we've previously recognized. We don't have a lot of research other than studies like this to demonstrate that, but that's because we don't have as much information about the ecology of these cockroaches. Just in the same way that we don't have, most of us haven't been exposed to the beauty that cockroaches exhibit. This is a cockroach in the genus Prosoplecta that is a ladybug mimic. And this is a cockroach called the pill cockroach you can find in Southeast Asia that rolls up like a pill bug, like an isopod. Roll up into a ball like that to protect its young. So I think the most interesting thing about this particular cockroach is not the fact that it can roll up into a ball or the fact that it is shiny or iridescent and pretty. I think it's the way that it feeds its offspring. So some of you might've heard about scientists trying to develop cockroach milk by looking at the proteins that different cockroaches develop or produce for their offspring and then trying to synthesize those so that we have a milk alternative. So lactation, cockroach lactation or lactation in insects is a very interesting phenomenon. And certain creature, certain insects uh, exhibit it in, certain, in some contexts. This cockroach exhibits lactation in a really peculiar way. So oftentimes if you find these, the, the females of this species, which you look at that photo, the one on the left is the female and the one on the right is the male. It's usually the case in some insects where the males will have wings and the females won't. So if you were to uncurl this cockroach, uh, you might find little nymphs on the inside hanging around around the hind quarters, like near the, the, the hind legs of this cockroach. And you, if you looked at the mouth parts of those offspring, they would be tapering like a little straw. What those mouth parts do is they allow them to plug into a pore on the underside of the abdomen of the female and they can consume milk there. Which is incredible to me that these cockroaches can roll up and protect their offspring. Their offspring can feed from glands, lactating glands, and they're just living calm lives in detritus and in and around plants in Southeast Asia. And so once again, if we were to just think of them immediately the same way we regard other cockroaches that we've interacted with, we might be un disinclined to appreciate the amazing aspects of their biology. And the last little bit I'd like to talk about is insects we're more familiar with. So we've gone through in significant detail the general diversity of certain groups of insects. The fact that insects are extremely abundant on the planet. They're found in so many different environments, some that are common, some that are extreme and unfamiliar to us. And they contribute to global ecology in ways that's, that are completely disproportionate to their size. Well, the insects that some of us are fortunately familiar with that do contribute directly and are in environments more common are, you know, biocontrol agents. So little wasps, little parasitoid wasps, like in Carcia formosa, that can lay eggs in other eggs or in small little creatures to help control them. The thing about it is, I think I want to emphasize, all right, I think I would like to emphasize something about the use of biological control, which is that. Biocontrol agents sometimes are thought of just as a simple ingredient you put in, as though, hey, you can put them down into uh, your, your, your farm, your garden, your orchard, just sprinkle them in haphazardly and they might work. Now, fortunately, not all of us are so naive. I especially uh, imagine that people with a little more consulting experience in regenerative agriculture understand that you need to manage the circumstance pretty well. So the thing about it is that I think is really interesting is biological control is familiar to people in that we have adopted or we recognize that getting away from chemicals can be a really good thing for us. 
and managing our environment in an intelligent and thoughtful way can be really good for the world. And biological control agents, the use of biological control can really be a good way to get people to think about things other than just direct mechanical manipulation, just controlling the inputs, avoiding tilling, making sure you have grazing animals, you bring in the insects, that's great. You also need to conserve an environment that's conducive to the insects. And if you want to make sure, for example, that the biological control agents stick around, if you want to conserve them, you need to make sure that when the pests they're, that they're specialists on aren't around, that they have some other place to be, that you have reservoirs nearby, that you have more diverse and lush plants around, that you have, you know, a variety of other insects and animals, a variety of other organisms that are present so that these biological control agents live in a diverse ecosystem. So I think that the thing about insects that is most important to remember is that they have a subjective experience of their own and that the best way that we can take advantage of their contributions is by appreciating that, that we need to remember that however much we think we know about them, there's always more to learn. And the more that we do learn about them, the more we realize that they can be incredible partners in all the efforts that we expend to try and improve the health of the, of the world. That pretty well concludes your presentation, Ralph. Yes, indeed. Well, we've got quite a few questions here. Uh, uh -huh. First off, as great, great information, um, great presentation. You know, there's a question I have here asking, do you have any idea what percentage of insect biodiversity has been lost with inside the United States? Ooh, in the U.S.? Hmm. I would have to look at most recent research. I mean, the, the estimates about biodiversity around the globe vary from 10 to 40%. Part of what's challenging about answering that particular question is that we have what's called the taxonomic impediment, especially in insects, where there's a lot of museum material and where that is unidentified. So there are a lot of forecasts. For a long time, people have been trying to estimate the total insect diversity in the world, right? We have over a million identified species right now, but some suggest that there might be upwards of 10 or 50 million total insects in the world. So while all kinds of anthropogenic climate change is occurring while we're destroying habitat inadvertently or deliberately. We're losing biodiversity. We all know that. However, we don't know how many species we've lost that are present. We can anticipate, we can kind of extrapolate, but we aren't, we don't, we don't know for sure. We do know that there are many species that, uh, or we, sorry, let me rephrase that. We do know that there are necessarily more species that are endangered in the US than we put on the endangered species list. Usually it's just things like butterflies and dragonflies, a few beetles that we recognize because they're large and charismatic that we're willing to protect. But insects are, especially some like Rocky Mountain Lotus, locust, for example, was a tremendous agricultural pest, you know, 100 years ago. And it disappeared completely because it is dependent on a very mm, fragile ecosystem. So it's dependent on Mm, arable land that is like flooded, so inundated land. So it needs to lay its eggs in periodically inundated uh, arable land, which is of course really uh, desirable for planting crops. And so many insects are sensitive to that. So I would say to, to, to round this off that it, it's really hard to tell exactly what the percentage of insect diversity or biodiversity in the, in the US we've lost because there's so much that we don't know about the insect diversity in the country. Thank you. You know, you brought up the, you know, talking about neo t neonics. Yeah. You know, can you kind of maybe address a little bit more how the neonics and other seed treatments are harming insect populations? Okay, yeah. So neonicotinoids are very effective as specific killers and controllers of insect populations. There are a couple of ways in which uh, they're affecting insects. So usually uh, when you're responsibly implementing integrated pest management, you're applying 
chemical treatments only when the insect population has exceeded the economic threshold. So the economic threshold tells you that the population is likely going to exceed the economic injury level in the event that you do not treat. So you go out and treat. And you treat a certain way in a certain place with a certain formulation so that it's likely only going to affect certain populations. The thing about seed treatments is that especially in areas where the soil is really dusty, it can fly away. And so you have these seed treatments where the neonics will get off the seeds and will get into the soil. And because it's poor infiltration and the soil is really dry, you have stuff moving around. And so particles of the soil will drift off to other areas and they'll get in like water, for example, or they'll get onto flowers. And all of that will then be, sorry, that will be present and it will, other insects will get exposed. And they'll, th that's how the non-target effects happen. There are also the non-target effects happen when um, insects will feed on like the juices or exudes of plants that have, that have been treated with a systemic insecticide. So if bees are coming and collecting water from like a cucurbit, for example, and there's a systemic insecticide that's used to try and control some cucurbit pests, then the bees are going to be exposed to those neonics. So neonics are, are specifically designed to control insects. And when we're able to use them in ways that they only affect the target pest, it's okay. We can generally use them in a responsible manner. But the fact that we have a context in which we can't control their distribution and in large part due to things that we have done, that's the reason why they're such a challenge because if, if they weren't so deadly, then we wouldn't be as worried about it. But even in small amounts, they can have such a disproportionate effect on wide ranges of insects. You know, in your presentation, you brought up, you know, indicator insects in different environments. Yes. You know, you know we always look at landscapes and you know, identifying indicator plants that are kind of telling us what's going on yes. with the soil. Uh, could you be a little more specific? I mean, what are some indicator insects maybe of a, you know, you're starting to witness a, you know, a system that's becoming more healthier, mm. more environmentally friendly, and then maybe on the opposing side of a system that's starting to degrade. I mean, what kind of indicator insects would you be present in both systems? Well, I'd say that in, let's just say a simple diverse landscape, uh, you, if you find predatory insects, that means that there is a sufficient population of primary consumers that can feed those predatory insects. And the primary consumers many times require diverse plants to feed on. So I, that's what I would do. So uh, I think Shane and Ray, we were at um, that field day in Kansas, where Ecdysis came out and showed that test where they'll take a Galeria larva, a waxworm, and they'll attach it to a little lump of clay and place it mm -hmm. and do a predator survey. That can be really effective to determine whether or not an ecosystem is healthy because with the insects, just like in the same way that like a wolf requires deer to feed on. So if you don't see the wolves around, there's probably not enough deer. Uh, these predatory insects are present because they have things to feed on. And some of these predators might have a lot of different insects that they eat. Now, a good example of a very specific insect that might indicate that something's there would be a, a parasitoid wasp, like in Carcia formosa. So many of these wasps are specialists. And if you want to tell if a certain, or let me phrase this differently. If you find those wasps present, it therefore suggests that their specialized host is present. And their specialized host might have an incredibly important effect on the environment, like a certain caterpillar that's an important pollinator or certain flies. So that's what I would say that if you're trying to evaluate the diversity of environment, if you start with a predator survey, it can work really well. Then you can start out looking at pollinators. And then let's see, what's another good example of something you might wanna look at? I will also look at the diversity of soil microorganisms because the soil is such an important component in the health of an environment and the insects will leave it. They'll die very quickly if the soil doesn't have what they need. So when you're performing a soil survey in combination with a, a predator survey, it can give you a pretty good, pretty good understanding of whether or not uh, the environment is healthy. And on the flip side, with an environment that isn't so healthy, I think if you find very few kinds of insects that are present, let's say you find a generalist 
herbivore that's able to eat pretty much anything and you don't find anything else there, it's a pretty bad sign because in most environments, you're going to find so many different microclimates, again, provided that there's a diversity of plants. And because insects are so good at taking advantage of different small little environments, if you find one kind of insect in an area, it means that there is no diversity in plants and no diversity in the environment. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we've got a question from Jim here. <clears throat> so from what you said earlier about mosquitoes, Mm -hmm. We can assume that they are important to agriculture because of their impact on biological systems. Can you expand upon that? Sure, yes, I can elaborate. So mosquitoes live in pools of water, stagnant pools of water, and those stagnant pools of water will be present in a number of different places. Most uh, global nutrient cycling happens as a consequence of microbial activity and many microbes live in small pools of water. In fact, if you collect all the small pools of water that are present around the world, it's an incredibly, it's, it's, a, it's a large amount of water, a large amount of surface area that's colonized by microbes. Well, the mosquitoes in these environments, there are mosquitoes in pretty much all of these different small pools of water, they are the primary determinants of microbial diversity. And so because global nutrient cycling is so important for the health of the planet, if the mosquitoes aren't correctly regulating the diversity of microbes, then we don't have the right kind of nutrient cycling and that affects everything. So that's one way. Another way that's also really important that kind of in the same way that the contribution of cockroaches hasn't been studied enough is the fact that mosquitoes are pollinators in some places, not just auxiliary pollinators, but primary pollinators, depending upon the context and depending upon the plant. And so there isn't, there hasn't been a, a good appreciation or let's say there hasn't been a good investigation a thorough investigation of the contribution that mosquitoes are making directly to the pollination and continuance of plants in different environments because they're constantly feeding on nectar. In any place that you find mosquitoes, there are definitely some plants that they fed on for nectar. And many of those plants have flowers that are small little umbels or cup shaped that can contact their thorax and dust pollen onto them. So there's two main ways that mosquitoes can be really important for agriculture are regulating microbial diversity in stagnant pools of water, and then their activity in pollinating plants. However, with regard to both of those things, because of our perspective and recognition of mosquitoes as public health concerns, we haven't done the requisite amount of research in order to demonstrate their value. You know, I was listening to the news here a while back. They were talking about mosquitoes in Florida, I think it was. Oh, yeah. They were going to release a strain that could not reproduce. I mm -hmm. mean, what's your perspective on that? I mean, real quick, before we go any further. Sure. So my perspective is what they were planning on releasing was a strain of mosquitoes that were genetically engineered to have what's called release of insects with a dominant lethal. So the way this works is you develop a strain of mosquitoes so that the males have... Uh, uh, or the males, yeah. So the males are are are, um, are are genetically sterilized, and the way it works is the dominant lethal gene is expressed when there is not a certain antimicrobial compound in the water column. So you genetically engineer these mosquitoes, then you release them. They're competing with with wild. Um, wild male mosquitoes. So you only release males because males are going to die after they mate and they're not going to continue on. So they'll mate with females and the, their offspring will acquire this dominant lethal gene. And then the offspring that develop, if there isn't a certain antibiotic present in the water, then the larvae don't develop to adulthood. And the reason for developing this is so that you have mosquitoes that are more competitive than mosquitoes that have been irradiated. So many of us are familiar with the sterile insect technique and its use in eradicating primary screwworm from North America and pushing it back down through Panama into South America. And the way they do that is they take young pupae from screwworms and they irradiate them. Well, the process of irradiating uh, an insect or any other organism can damage all kinds of things in its genes. And when you release them, they might not be as competitive. They might not be as successful in courtship. And so in order to make the technique, the sterile insect technique more, more efficient, in order to decrease the total number of organisms you need to release, 
and decrease the time until you observe an effect, meaning the population is reduced. You want males that you release that have more competitive ability. So if you genetically engineer them so that they provide a gene that results in the offspring not developing in the presence of the, the antibiotic, then it works really well. And so my perspective is that it's a very safe, safe technology that I understand the precautionary principle and especially from the perspective of protecting local wildlife and understanding what might happen across the world. We need to be concerned. We need to carefully scrutinize the approaches we're taking. However, it's unlikely that genetically engineered male mosquitoes are going to result in a widespread problem with other species or even that species in particular. It's probably just going to have the effect that we expect, which is that it's going to decrease the local population of mosquitoes and thereby reduce disease risk. We've got a question here from Stefan. Okay. Don't most cockroaches and many other insects also emit a lot of microbial methane via their digestive systems? Excellent question. So there's something uh, I like to share with people that I didn't share here, which is that we often like to think about cows as a really important contributor to global environmental methane. Well, one group of organisms that can arguably rival cows in the amount of methane that they release from digestion is termites. So termites feed on a lot of cellulose and cellulose is challenging to digest. The reason why cows release so much methane is because in their rumen they have symbiotic microbes that help them digest the cellulose and the plants to eat. Well, termites do the same thing and termites are all over the world. Many of them are feeding in grasslands and stuff like that, not just feeding on houses, for example. And so when they're feeding on the cellulose, they need, to, they need some help to digest it. And in the process, those symbiotes release the methane. So yes, there are many animals that, or many insects that produce methane as a consequence of their digestion. Cockroaches generally don't, except for the termites, which are just specialized cockroaches. So there are certain other insects that feed on cellulose that do release methane, but the ones that are most important are the termites. One, because of the size of their colonies and the biomass that they have, and it also because of the particular symbiotes that they have that help them in their digestion. Thank you. Just a real, clarif quick, real, real quick clarification. I know I read somewhere termites contain a lot of free living nitrogen fixating bacteria in their hind gut, I guess it would be. And just if you could elaborate on that, because I noticed a lot of you know, systems will see cockroaches, especially in more arid environments. And I, I kind of assume that's mother's nature's way of trying to help you know, provide microbial diversity. Mm -hmm with the insect population? Yeah, so termites have intestinal endosymbionts and the termites are just evolved or derived, I shouldn't say evolved, derived cockroaches in truth. Uh, they aren't a separate order from the cockroaches, they evolved from within a, a group of cockroaches and they're closely related to the wood roaches in the genus Cryptocircus. And so many cockroaches do have intestinal endosymbionts that help them in their digestion and they release things. They also have fat body endosymbionts. So cockroaches and all other insects have an organ called a fat body, which is important for digestion, immunity, and detoxification. And so in that, in cockroaches, they have these endosymbionts that help them store nitrogen. Those endosymbionts help them store nitrogen and that's why they're, they're particularly resilient. So in the event that they are starving, they can sequester some of their urine, their uric acid, and then metabolize it later. So instead of starving to death because of uh, nitrogen scarcity, like many other insects, the cockroaches are able to survive because they have some stored up nitrogen that they can re-metabolize later. So insect frass can indeed be an important source of fertilizer and they can, they can provide it on their own. Uh, yes, they can also, or they can also contribute to an environment as a consequence of their intestinal endosymbionts. So if you want some elaboration on how nitrogen fixation and how the release of that into the environment could be helpful from the standpoint of insects is because insects are also getting, some of them are getting water through their rectum. So the whole process, they're, they're not getting air as much, right? But they are breathing, right? They're in, in inhaling through their rectum. They're ventilating through their rectum sometimes for the purpose in arid environments in particular, of acquiring enough water. And so in the process, that's how nitrogen fixation can happen, just in the same way it can happen in plant roots. Well, Ken's got an interesting question here for you, Ralph. So All right. what are your favorite insects to dine on 
And oh. <laughs> do you regularly consume them? Yes, I do. I should have brought some for this presentation <laughs> so you could see me eat them. Uh, I have some in my fridge right now. Uh, my favorite insects to consume. Ooh, let's see. Mm. Ant pupae are quite good. I'd say if you can have a salad of ant pupae, that's probably pretty tasty. I had this air, this apple pear salad a few years ago with ant pupae sprinkled across it. Uh, and I was, I think, what else did I have with that? It was, um, I think there were some sago worms I had. So there are these weevils that you can find in, in palm, right? They're called sago worms, but they're not, they're not worms. Of course, they're caterpillars, they're beetle grubs. And so you find them in, in the crown, like in heart of palm. Uh, they're, they're feeders in the crown, they're like you'll kill palm trees that way. But they're, the grubs of these weevils are quite delicious. They might be, you know, the size of like a pinky nail, and they get pretty big. And so, but ant pupae are really good. In, uh, in Southern Mexico, in Oaxaca, there's something called escamole that people will eat. And that's like a mix of um, ant pupae and larvae. So I would suggest that if you really want to start eating insects, Japulines are pretty good. Those are uh, Oaxacan fried grasshoppers. That's like a nice introduction. I would skip mealworms. Everybody eats mealworms um, and everybody eats cricket powder, but they're pretty tasteless. So the chapulines are pretty good, especially the way they naturally season them with like lime and, um, and cilantro. Then I would go to escamole. Uh, I would then, what would I eat? Um, you could try magui worms. Like if any of you have had mezcal, the worm at the bottom of the bottle is a magui worm, like a red magui worm. You can get those as well. You can get them fried and they're pretty good. Then, um, oh, you know, here's a context in which many of you might have already eaten some insects without knowing it. There are stink bugs you can find in Southern Mexico that people call humiles, and they're often ground up and used as the primary odorous constituent of moles. So many traditional moles in Oaxaca are flavored with ground up stink bugs. So of course the name stink bug is somewhat uh, misleading because many of them are scent bugs. They have pleasant odors, not just the stinky odors that we're familiar with from some of the like the green stink bugs where we've been exposed to in the United States. Thank you. Alejandro has a question Kane. here. Yes, Kane. go ahead. Kane, I, I have a, a question for Ralph. Ralph, hey, first, Ray. thank you for coming. It's good to hear you, Ralph. You're a brilliant, great teacher. I appreciate you. I'm so glad Shane got you here. Thank you so much. And I was very fortunate to work with Ralph in the Gen General Mills Project. And you and I walked through many, many fields, Ralph. And um, in our agro ecosystem, you gave us a beautiful, elegant explanation how important biology, insect biology is. In your mind, since 44% of our land is used in agriculture and our, we have some very intrusive tools like tillage and fungicides mm. and insecticides and it's hurting insect biodiversity. And, you know, you and I had talked about, I was kind of shocked that, you know, a lot of people don't realize that 80% of our, uh, the insects, uh, you know, complete their life cycle through, part of their life cycle through the soil. And so my question is, um, of these tools like fungicides, insecticides, and tillage, you know, uh, in your mind, how destructive do you think these are to our agroecosystems mm. uh, I mean, and to insect populations? And which one do you think would be the worst one? Ooh. Oh, you love answering the tough questions, Ray. I remember those walks in the field. I would say, oh, man. Well, tillage is very destructive because many insects require uh, multiple years within one place in the soil. Like one way we recognize that tilling can be really dangerous for native bees, or one, one way we recognize that tilling can be really dangerous for natural ecosystems is that it can disrupt the life cycle of native or solitary bees because they might be there for more than one year. And so you might till one season and if the if the, the generation time for that bee starts after you're done tilling and then ends before you till again, great. But if it lasts even a year and a half, that's a problem because you're probably gonna disrupt a whole generation as a consequence of you ripping up the ground. 
So ground nesting bees, we've come to recognize are really vulnerable to it. And it's not just the bees. There are many insects that will be disturbed by the presence of, uh, by the, the action of tilling. Then additionally, the, the, yeah, the fungicides. So it's hard for me to say if whether the fungicides or the insecticides are a directly a problem. So some insects are heavily dependent on their intestinal into symbionts. So if I can move from fungicide and just say antimicrobial compounds in general, some of them are really affected. And if you eliminate the intestinal into symbionts through some fungicidal or antimicrobial compound that's around, then that'll affect them. Sometimes it can be just as deadly as an insecticide that's killing them physiologically through, or that's killing them directly, right? It can be just as, as uh, it can affect their death just as quickly as if you were to kill them directly with an insecticide. Because if you're dependent on an intestinal or a fat body into symbiont that provides you with additional nutrients and you kill it, then you're not going to be able to survive. And so that's what's, what's the big difference. I mean, there's not a real difference if you're killed by a chemical or if you're into symbionts are killed and then you're unable to survive. You don't have enough nutrients. So it's hard for me to say which of those. I'd say um, the distribution of insecticides in environments is probably really, really bad because many of them have residual effect and they'll, they'll drift across environments, like when we were talking about seed treatments. So even though tillage is really bad, you till one field. Despite it being a widespread practice, you till one field, it's not going to affect the other field. But if you put a seed treatment on dry ground that doesn't has poor infiltration, that seed treatment might distribute itself across many other fields, and it could therefore have a much greater effect on a local environment. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome. Thank you, Ray. We have a hey, question. Ray. Go ahead, David. Yeah. So when thinking, I was just thinking about this. Is I've been in two environments right now in the past couple of years where uh, in the springtime they either fight pill bugs mm. or in other environments they fight a lot of slugs. Oh, yeah. And um, which are damaging to their growing crops typically, especially if they have a, you know, some guys blame it on the cover crop. But um, so what they end up doing is putting an incredibly high rate of like lower span or um, oh. some over the um, insecticide out there to basically that's their, their means of killing those crustaceans. Mm. And at those high of rates that they're applying that, which are totally off label, how that has got to be incredibly devastating to the insect population at a much broader scale, is it not? I'd say so. I'd say any off-label use is a problem. I mean, one reason for labeling the use of insecticides a certain way is because they take into account the possible consequences. It's only more recently that non-target effects or possible non-target effects have been incorporated into warning labels and the safe dosage recommendations. Uh, however, just in that specific the example that you brought up, yeah, if, uh, and it, it, uh, a high off-label use of lores ban in an environment has got to be affecting the other insects really strongly. I, I can't imagine it being inconsequential. One of the things that we have actually seen down in southern Illinois is splitting some fields um, with and without seed treatments mm -hmm. is that the slugs will actually tend to eat the plants that have a seed treatment on it oh. because the beetles um as soon as they you know even if that slug goes across that that plant that's had that seed treatment as soon as a ground beetle just takes one bite of it yeah it, it falls over and starts to die you know yeah <laughs> it's amazing that you know they wouldn't even the 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 slugs wouldn't even go and and chew on the plants that were not treated, but they knew exactly the plants that were treated and would just demolish those. Oh, wow. Yeah. I have another question here, Ralph. All right. Malahandro, is there a detrimental effect of egg mobiles 
on the insect populations. I know a lot of operations are, you know, they're bringing their chickens in with an egg mobile and usually moving them every mm. two to three days. Mm. But you have a pretty high concentration of a predator in a yeah. specific region. Mm. Yeah, I'd say depends upon where and depends upon how often. Because a high concentration of predators in a certain area won't necessarily eliminate the insect population from the greater geographical area. A lot of insects can disperse, even though that dispersal, dispersal, radi dispersal radius might be small. Like for mosquitoes, many mosquitoes don't fly past like a mile from where they develop as, as larvae, but it depends upon the insect. So you bring in some chickens, they're feeding on the insects. Chickens can't get everywhere and they're not gonna eat all the insects because they're gonna get satiated eventually. Like the concept of predator satiation is one reason why insect populations are so large. So when mayflies emerge in large numbers and when cicadas emerge in large numbers, they're taking advantage of predator satiation so that even if every single predator in the environment consumes to their overflowing, so they're so full that they can't eat anymore, there's still gonna be enough around, enough individuals around to continue the species and maintain the population. So most insect populations have many more individuals than are needed to satisfy the predators. Now, when you bring in chickens that aren't around there, it might be possible that the chickens are larger in number or there, there's not the same relationship between the prey population and the predator population. However, because of the fact that chickens don't, well, no, I should, let, me, let me rephrase that. I would say, again, depending upon the environment you're in, the chickens aren't gonna eat every single insect that exists there because insects are good at getting away and there are places that they can hide and chickens aren't perfect, you know? They are good at finding food because they're motivated, but they don't find every single insect that's present unless you were to eliminate all the crops that the insects can hide under. So if, you know, going back to what, what is, you know, constantly advocated by understanding ag, making sure that there is a living root and making sure you have a great diversity of crops, that's a context or, or those things can prevent an insect population from being eliminated completely by predators because they have places to hide. So I'd say the circumstance in which an egg mobile would be really detrimental to an insect population would be if it's completely bare ground and it's smooth so that it's very easy for the chickens to find all the insects. And then they eat everything, except for the stuff that's buried in the soil. But in most circumstances, there's gonna be some place that some insects can hide. And so as a consequence of the fact that insects reproduce very quickly, the egg mobiles, the chickens aren't gonna eliminate everything completely. And they're definitely not gonna eliminate all the insects from a local geographic area. Thank you. Another question here is how disruptive, disruptive is 5G technology wavelengths hmm. to insect populations? Oh, hmm. So it's inconclusive whether or not electronic waves are influencing insect migration patterns or influencing their behavior. We do know that lights, for example, have influenced the behavior of nocturnal insect populations. And some of them are able to respond in ways that are effective for them, right? So like moths flying around, they might get distracted by the lights, like, you know, a moth flying into a flame. It's flying into the flame because it's confused by the source of the light and it flies around it. Usually when they're navigating by a diffuse kind of light, they keep it in a certain angle. And so if they're flying near a, uh, a flame, which is this point source of light, and they'll circle around it. And as a consequence, they'll eventually get closer and closer, right? Like we've seen before, is often referenced in fiction. Well, a light bulb can prevent them from doing that. That's why a bug light works. They'll fly up at the light and they'll hit it. Uh, and in many places where there's light going on constantly, you have these moths who are flying and it's affecting their population, but some of them have been able to respond. So we do know that electronics does affect insects. It's unclear if 5G specifically affects insects. So um, I would suspect that, it's, that it probably isn't having an effect on insect behavior or migration patterns, but you know, that kind of thing is, is a testable hypothesis. So because I haven't seen any evidence on that being tested, I can't answer directly. Stefan's got another good question here. Uh, do herbicides that act like antibiotics, i.e. Lil phosphate, 
alter the microbial gut of insects as they do with humans and I think you meant to say soils. There's some evidence that pesticides or herbicides that have an antibiotic function can affect the health and development of insects. So I think if anyone's really interested in the consequence of glyphosate and stuff like that, I could send them some relevant literature. I'll say just in general that yes, you need to be careful about the possible effect of herbicides, especially those that have an effect on things that are important to the lives of the insects. So as, the, as your, your question is asking, hey, if it can affect the, in, the intestinal microbiota of, of, an, of a human being, a mammal or something like that, can it affect insects? There, there's evidence that many compounds can do that to insects as well. David has another great question here. In central Illinois, we have been battling buffalo gnats since Ooh, early yeah. 2000s, <laughs> typically in the months from mid-April through June. Mm -hmm. They seem to be getting worse annually. These gnats have killed a lot of poultry and game birds. Yeah. What would be the cause of these gnats in the last 20 years? And is mm. there any predator insects that feed on buffalo gnats? So buffalo gnats are black flies. I think buffalo gnat is the, uh, the regional term for black flies in the family Simuliidae. By um, interesting coincidence, I was testing repellents against black flies in Minnesota before I met everyone in Kansas. So I'm familiar with the problems in Illinois with buffalo gnats. They'll bite you. It's really painful. You don't like them. I'd say that, um, I mean, the standard explanation for changes in insect populations is climate change. So it's possible that there has been an increase in populations of buffalo gnats because uh, there have been more, more time in the year when the the rivers that they grow up in the moving water that they develop in is available and is above the minimum temperature for them to develop effectively so if things get warmer then we have snow melting more quickly and then the river warms up more quickly and as a consequence the buffalo gnats can start their life cycle earlier so that's one possible explanation predators let's see um they are filter feeders and they stay present in one place. So there are insects you can find in the water body that will eat them. Uh, it's hard to try and, if the question is implying this, it's hard to try and create a circumstance that where there's biological control to influence the populations of black flies. But there are repellents that work pretty well. So including some that I and my company, we've tested Pretty successfully. So if, if any of you have questions about repellents, we can, we can talk about that as well. Um, it, it might be better to talk about that um, in, a, in a slightly different context, but I'm happy to answer those questions explicitly. So yeah, I would, I would protect yourself against black flies with repellents as opposed to biological control. I think one reason why the populations might have gotten worse in the Midwest is a consequence of climate change. And yeah, it is a huge problem with buffalo gnats killing poultry and game birds in part because of their vectoring of leukocytozoonosis, which if I'm trying to remember the colloquial term for that, um, that disease, but it's, um, is it turkey malaria? It's, um, if anyone knows, if anyone remembers, feel free to chime in. But um, yeah, it's been a huge problem in like, um, in Turkey, like, like turkey farms over the past like 20 or 30 years. So repellent can be really good in that context as well. Thank you. Is there any other further questions from any of the panelists here this evening? Well, Ralph, I think we're going to call it a wrap here. I'd just like to thank all the participants who attended tonight's webinar um, on behalf of Understanding Ag and Soil Health Academy. Thank you for attending. Uh, be sure to keep posted. We've got several webinars we're working on that we'll be uh, informing everybody about in the next week or two. And also let people make aware that we are going to have online series of Soil Health Academies, hopefully late this year, that will be available. So people who can't attend a regular academy can do it online. Mm. So we're excited about this opportunity that's coming. So Ralph, once again, thank you for your time, your knowledge, um, your passion for entomology. And we really do appreciate your presence this evening. Thank you very much, Shane. It was yes, wonderful to talk to you all. Thank you, everyone.